Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. I want to begin this morning by reading to you another portion of God's Word. So if you have your Bible or your New Testament with you this morning, and I trust you have, I'm going to the Gospel of Luke the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 15, I'm going to read a story which is quite familiar, I'm sure, to a number of you. I'm breaking into this 15th chapter at the 11th verse, and I'm only reading down to verse 24. As you'll understand, this is not all of the story that Jesus is telling here, but it is sufficient for our our cause this morning. Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. No one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. Was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. That is the word of the Lord. Francois Bizot was a young French ethnologist who in 1971 was captured by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. After three months of torturous incarceration, he was set free. Four years later, the Khmer Rouge entered Phnom Penh. And Francois Bizot became the official intermediary between that ruthless conqueror and the terrified refugees who were hiding behind the gate in the French embassy. 30 years later, he recorded his horrific experience in a book, which I commend to you, a little book simply called The Gate. You see, behind the gate in the compound of the French embassy, if you had the correct papers, you would find sustenance and safety. 
But outside that gate in Phnom Penh, roamed ruthlessly and lawlessly and eager to destroy anyone who went against their will were those of Pol Pot's regime. This, this slice of history is vividly portrayed in the uh, Academy Award-winning feature, The Killing Fields. It's this, it's this scene, it's this picture of security on the one hand and enemies on the other hand that you find in verse 5 of the 23rd Psalm. And once again, I'm going back to this portion of God's Word as we are continuing Sunday by Sunday to walk through it together. The 23rd Psalm, the fifth verse. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This morning I want to look at this verse, but I, I, I'm warning you, I'm going to look at it in a very general way. Uh, maybe almost in the sense of just giving you an introduction to it, giving you some information about it. And then Lord willing, next Sunday, we'll pick it up again and look at it in a much more uh, pastoral and practical way. But this morning I simply want to outline something of what this, this verse is about from the pages of history, from the perspective of culture, and from the parable of Jesus. And, and I must own my indebtedness to uh, works done by a gentleman called Dr. Kenneth Bailey. Uh, Dr. Bailey spent over 40 years living and teaching New Testament in Egypt and Lebanon and Jerusalem and Cyprus, and he is somewhat of a specialist in ancient versions and Middle Eastern culture and anthropology. But here's my, my, my first point, if you have a copy of my outline this morning. To consider this fifth verse in light of the pages of, of history. In other words, why did David write this? That's my simple question to begin with. My first question. Why did David write this verse, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What, what experience had he, had he known? Or what, what experience in history was on his mind as he penned this, this portion of Scripture? Well, various suggestions have been made. I simply want to give you three of them here. The first is this. Maybe he was thinking about God's provision and protection for his ancient people in their wilderness wanderings. They'd come out of Egypt, they're in the wilderness. How did God provide for them? They complained that at a time they would have rather been back in Egypt because they were hungry, they were thirsty, they were complaining, but God provided for his people. If you come with me in your Bible, if you've got it open to the book of Psalms, I'm going to Psalm 78, Psalm 78 and verse 17. Psalm 78 and verse 17. Here is a reflection, here is a reference back to that historic occasion. Yet they sin still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the wilderness? So here's a parallel portion to this verse in the 23rd Psalm. And so maybe it was this, this experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness that caused him to write this. The second suggestion could be that it was God's provision and protection for the prophet Elijah. If you know the story of Elijah, he won that great victory uh, uh, over the prophets of Baal, 
He, 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 he leads the people in the declaration of the Lord. He alone is God. But then he is scared to death by a slip of a girl called Jezebel and he runs for his life. He runs to hide. And if you come again in your scriptures this time to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4. 1 Kings 19 and verse 4 and we read, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. Once more, an illustration of God's providing for someone, God preparing a table for them, God supplying their needs. The third suggestion that I would put to you and which may have been on David's mind at this time is an incident that happened to him personally. I'm turning this time to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 27. 2 Samuel 17 and in verse 27, the names of the the Gileadite chieftains is mentioned. David has been fleeing from Absalom. He's running for his life. And David comes, as it were, to these chieftains. And in verse 28, we're told they brought beds, basins, and earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans, and lentils, honey and curds, and sheep and cheese from the herd. For David and the people with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness." So once again, here is a a picture, an incident, an experience of being in the wilderness without anything. And it may have been these things that caused David to write what he does in this, our fifth verse of Psalm 23. Whatever though be the historic triggers that set this off, what you see in this fifth verse is surely something of divine uh, intimacy. For it uses those words, those, those uh, personal pl- uh, pronouns that were picked up in the earlier verses of the chapter, verse 4, where it's put in terms of you and me. Not he, not him, but you and me. David is continuing to speak and have intimate associations with God. He prepares a table, points us to God's generosity. And then this feasting takes place in the sight of his enemies who look on helplessly. And so David is speaking not only about intimacy and generosity, but about his security. He is secure in this place where he is being satisfied. And that then leads me to my second major point this morning, which is this. To consider this verse in light of the perspective of of culture, the culture of the times and the days in which this was written. I want you to use your imagination. Imagine a desert scene, and there is a a hot, panting fugitive fleeing for his life. He is being pursued, he is being hunted by those who are fierce for revenge. Because you see, in a moment of passion, he had attacked his brother and now he is fleeing for his life and his brother's friends are out to get him. And so he flees and he runs into the desert. The wild, inhospitable waste stretches out before him. But there is no bush to offer secret shelter. There is no rock offering him a safe defence. 
And he can almost feel, you know, the, the hot breath of his pursuers on the back of his neck. Where shall he turn? And he scans the horizon. And in the distance, he discerns the dim outline of a desert tent. And so off he sets. And the way is hard, the enemy is near, the night is falling, but with all his energy and with all his strength, he presses on until eventually he reaches out and he touches the tent's rope and he knows that he is safe. He is now the guest of that tent dweller who welcomes him into his tent, places a lavish meal before him, and then his enemies arrive, but they can do nothing. They cannot touch him. They must remain standing, frowning outside because they know full well the desert culture that a man's tent is a place of refuge, just like the cities of refuge in the Old Testament. They cannot do anything. They just have to stand outside and look. We're inside. This young man is safe and secure, and he may have well said to himself, to his host, you have prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. This is one scenario which may lie behind these words. But there are two items of, of culture that, that I would put before you this morning. As we look at this text, the first is this aspect of hospitality. You prepare a table before me. In, in Middle Eastern culture, when you wanted the community to know that you have acquired wealth, you did not go out and buy a very expensive motor car or build or buy a larger house. Rather, you threw a party and you threw a lavish party. You provided enough food and drink for three times the number of guests that you would invite to your party. You would prepare a table because those words don't mean that you get out a saw and a hammer and nail and you actually build a table. It means that you prepare a lavish meal. As I was working on this at the end of the week, I was thinking of uh, uh, our, our church luncheons. It was something like that. We have our men who set up the tables, but is that the luncheon? No, no, no. You set up the tables for what? For putting the food on. And then we come and we stay together and we dine together and we talk together and we fellowship together. This is the picture here. You get an illustration of what I'm driving at in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 and the first eight verses. Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1. Genesis 18, 1. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your seven. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on. Now, uh, you know, I, I read this in the sense with a chuckle to myself. He, he, Abraham at this point sounds very British. He understood, you know, I'll give you a morsel of bread, you know, I'll, I'll give you a corner of a slice of a loaf. But what does he do? Since you've come to, so they said, do as you have done. 
So Abraham, verse 6, Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seers of fine flour kneaded and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. This is the culture. This is what it meant to prepare a table, to carefully, generously, lavishly provide for your guests. And the reference, of course, to anointing was also part of that proper hospitality, the, 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 the washing of one's feet, the anointing with oil, perfume, so they'd be refreshed and, and renewed. You know, you have that lovely story in Luke 7, where you get Mary anointing our Lord's head with oil. So that, that's, that, that anointing was for beautification, it was for perfume, it was the sign that you are welcomed, it is the sign that we're honored to have you, it's the sign that we love you, it's the sign that you're safe here. And then at this party, hospitality, the drink waiter is always hovering by. So that every time you would take a sip of drink from your glass, he'd be there to, to replenish it. And he'd be so keen for you not to, not to miss anything. He would pour in so much that your cup would overflow. Such was the generosity. No stone was left unturned. Hospitality was breathtaking. It was lavish. And this is the picture here when David says, you prepare a table for me. He's not talking about a piece of toast and coffee. He's talking about a banquet, a lavish banquet. The second thing I would point you to then is this aspect of hostility. For David is enjoying this banquet in the presence of his enemies. You see, David is describing a very public banquet where his enemies are observing but cannot intervene. And the host is demonstrating his love for his guest irrespective of who is looking on. And again, this is a picture that, that you get in, in, in the New Testament. Jesus goes to spend the night with Zacchaeus and his audience, the community, were astounded, were amazed. They were the enemy. How could this man go and spend the night with such a sinner as Zacchaeus? Well, you get it in Mark chapter 6 where Jesus provided a meal for 5,000 people in the very presence, we might say, of their enemy. Herod. So that here is a wealthy host providing a lavish public banquet for his guest and providing a safe and secure place from his enemies. For he is now untouchable. All the hallowed sanctions of hospitality gather around him for his defense. And such was the undimmed glory of Middle Eastern hospitality that to injure a guest or to allow another to injure a guest was the mark of deepest depravity. The guest could lie down in peace amidst plenty and rest securely. In the words of J.H. Jowett, Psalm 23, verse 5, such is the desert symbol of sufficiency and security. So the culture helps us to understand a little bit about what David is saying here. But then my third major point for the morning is this. To consider Psalm 23 and verse 5 in the light of the parable of Jesus. Come with me to that portion I read in your hearing at the beginning of this message. I'm going back to Luke's gospel and that 15th chapter, to that story that I'm sure many, many of us 
know. And we have read of this account on a number of occasions. This, this story that we find here, what, what we commonly call the story of the prodigal son. But let me, let me say three simple things before I try and unpackage what's going on here and how it relates to this text of the 23rd Psalm. You'll notice that the beginning of chapter 15 and verses 1 and 2, the context of Jesus' story is given to us. And often we miss these little things. But notice, please, chapter 15 and verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, that is to our Lord. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. This is the point now that Jesus is going to pick up and he's going to deal with it by way of parable. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Do you see a, a reference here to Psalm 23 and verse 5? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Jesus here is the host. Sinners are his guests. The Pharisees are the enemy. He, this man, receives sinners and eats with them. The second thing I would draw out is born out in verse 3. So then he told them this parable. This parable. We usually think of Luke 15 as being a chapter with three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost silver, the parable of the lost son. But it's not. It's all one. These are just, if I may cheekily say, these are Jesus' three points to his one sermon. It's singular. He's going to give them a parable which has three parts to it. And the other thing I'd point out, and you get this in verse 11. And he said to them, there was a man who had not one son, but two sons. It's not the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of the prodigal sons. We, we've led sort of a tradition color our thinking when we come to this portion. So that here Jesus is dealing with the point that he receives and eats with sinners. So, what can we glean from this story of the prodigal sons? Let me highlight four scenes from it. The first scene is the son's shamelessness, the younger son's shamelessness. The ranking in a Middle Eastern home was this. First, there was the father. Secondly, was the older brother. And then thirdly, was the younger son. So that it is startling to hear that the opening speech here is delivered by the lowest ranking member. But the real shock of the speech is this, the very thing that this young son requests. And what does he request? Verse 12, and the youngest of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. What is the young son saying here? He is asking for his inheritance while the father is still alive. And thus, by so making this request, is saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. He is saying, Dad, drop dead because I now want my inheritance. 
It's not a kindly word. It's not a usual word. He's going against all culture and all tradition here within the family. The expected response then from the father is that he will absolutely refuse the request. He will drive the boy out of the house, both with verbal abuse and physical punishment because there was a, 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 an act, a slap, as it were, from the back of a hand that a father had the right to give to a son who would even suggest such a thing within the culture. But what we see here is the father reprocessing anger into grace. And by that grace demonstrates his costly love because we read that he did divide the property between the sons. Here is the father's willingness to endure the agony of rejected love. The son has totally rejected him. But the point I want you to get here is, is this. The youngest son considers it a misfortune to have to live under the father's roof. He is tired of having to obey his father. So he is choosing rather to be separated from him, to find his own pleasure. And hence we see his shamelessness in the fact that he wishes his father dead. My second sub point then is this. The second scene, the son's sinfulness. Because the son does break the relationship with his family. He sells and he turns his inheritance into cash and he leaves. And he actually leaves very quickly because the beginning of verse 13 says, and not many days. And he does it because news of what was happening in this family would get out to the village. Those of you who have any lived in the village or visited a village in the Middle East or a small town would know word gets around so quickly. You don't need Facebook. It goes from house to house, from person to person quickly. And the people in the village would have understood what this boy has demanded, his shamelessness, and they would have been out to get him because he has brought dishonor to this village. And so what he's doing, he's having to do quickly. And so he gets what he has. He goes into a far country. He sustains himself there for some time, probably a long time, but he wastes his inheritance on what is described as expensive living. We used to say pockets with holes in them. Your money would just go. Blow it in everything. But then a change happens. There is a famine. And life now becomes desperate. He has no family. He has no friends to fall back on. And his very survival is threatened. And so Jesus now, in telling this story, presents a very powerful and repulsive picture of how depraved this Jewish boy has now become. This Jewish boy who wished his father dead, who is now in a far country, who has lost the inheritance to a Gentile in a Gentile city and now ends up feeding pigs. He sought for pleasure and he reaped pain. He sought for freedom and he gets bondage. And the shocking state of affairs gets to the point in verse 16 where this Jewish boy wanted to be a pig. He wanted to be a pig because the pigs had food and he didn't. Absolute anathema for a Jewish person. He had no food, and so he's descended from plenty to poverty. This is actually an amazing illustration of what Paul speaks about in the second half of Romans chapter 1. And so my third scene 
I've entitled The Son's Solution. Because you see, while we may say that the sun is down, he's not out. He's down, but he's not out. Verse 17 says, but when he came to himself. Now, often, this point in the story is regarded as the son's repentance, that he is now repenting and going to return home. Let me give you an alternative understanding or view of this. Do you remember what we said when we were speaking about Psalm 23, verse 3? He restores my soul. The picture is of the shepherd going and by his love and rescuing the sheep, the sheep actually repents. That's included in the word restore. There's a repentance there. The picture of the shepherd finding the lost sheep in Luke 15, 5 is a picture, as it were, of repentance. Jesus here is, is defining repentance in this way. The acceptance of being found. The acceptance that you've been lost, but now you have been found. That repentance is not something the person does independently of God, but is the response of the person that has been inspired, as it were, or created by his gracious acceptance by the one who's come to seek and to save him. So come back to the boy, to this Jewish boy. We're told he came to himself. Those words only appear in one other portion of God's Word. You get it in Acts chapter 12 and verse 11. Peter had been in prison. The angel came. He's out of prison. He's allowed through the city gates, and as it were. He's making a way to the house of Mark John where there's a prayer meeting. And we're told when he gets through, the angel leaves him. He comes to himself in the sense that all of a sudden he wakes up and he realizes the reality of the situation. He realizes where he is. He understands now what has happened. He now has a whole new view of the situation. And so this prodigal, he has a solution to his problem. And his solution is this. He will try to convince his father to have him trained as a free self supporting craftsman. Oh, he knows that he is no longer worthy to be his son, but with the paid position per the kindness of his father, he will eventually be able to earn enough money to pay the father back for what he had taken from him, and thus he will be able to earn and work his way to be accepted and to be considered to be worthy by his father. This is his solution to his situation. He will go home and try and talk to his father into financing him to train him as a craftsman. Not as a slave, because slaves don't get paid. Not as a servant, because servants don't get paid. The Greek word that is used here is not doulos or diakonios. It is the word for a hired craftsman. So he is going home to say, Dad, can you speak to such and such up the road in his workshop? See if he can train me as a carpenter. I will earn good money and I will pay you back. He still thinks he can sort out this problem. This young man at this point in the story still thinks he can save himself. He can make himself worthy and acceptable. And so my final scene, the son's salvation from verse 20 to 24. And I summarize it under two words, compassion and celebration. Compassion. Here comes the son, confident that he has a solution to his problem. He will try once and again to manipulate his father. Father. 
He will go to his father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Where did he get those words from? They are the words of Pharaoh that Pharaoh used to manipulate Moses when Moses is trying to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. He employs Pharaoh's words. He says he will, yeah, I've sinned. I've sinned. You see, he, like Pharaoh, was more concerned about the consequences of his sin than about sin itself. This is not a picture of biblical repentance, beloved. He's going now to make this He's put his words carefully together. He's going to try and impress the Father, manipulate the Father to do what he wants. But now our focus comes to the Father, verse 20. While the Son is still a long way off, in other words, he is still lost. At this point in the story, he is still lost. His Father sees him. His Father has compassion on him. And his Father runs to him. Now, if I... Put all this in some, some biblical or theological terms. Let me put it this way. What you're getting here is a picture of incarnation. The father in the story is a picture of Jesus who left his home in glory to enter the streets of the town and villages of his creation. And Jesus came and humbled himself where do you see humiliation here? In the Father running. No Middle Eastern aged person would ever run. Because in running, they'd have to pick up their garments and you would see something of their ankles, something of their legs, and that was total humiliation. So that in running to see the Son, the Father is willing to publicly humiliate himself. He humbles himself. Because, you know, sometimes we, we see things like this through Western eyes instead of Middle Eastern eyes. The, the picture here is not, it's not as though you see an elderly person running along Heatherton Road all by himself, and nobody's taking any notice. No, no, no. This is a village. This is a town. It's more like going to a mall on a sale day, and the father's running through it. Everybody sees him. He's bumping and weaving his way through the crowd, running to the sun. And people are gassed, shocked at the sight they see, the humiliation of this man. But then there's reconciliation and repentance. The father runs to the son and finds the son and embraces him. And such is the degree of the father's love and so deep is the father's love that the son begins but cannot finish his practice speech, his manipulative message. If you notice what he thinks in his mind at the beginning, this is what I'm going to do when I go home. These are the things I'm going to say to my father. And then when you read what he says to the father, he doesn't get through the statement. He is overwhelmed by the love of the father. Love has found him. The shepherd has found his sheep. The costly love of the suffering Savior, the Father, causes the Son to repent. And peace now exists. Because from verse 22 to 24, you find this celebration. We celebrate, we rejoice, because why? What does he say here? Verse 24, this my Son was dead and is alive again. When did he become alive? When the father kissed him and put the garments on him and poured out his love on him. He was lost and he's found. He was lost until he got to the very point of that village where the father met him and the father had to meet him 
because it was so dangerous for the son to go into the village because the, the, the village still remembered the disrespect he had shown and they would have punished him by coming in. But he comes into the village dressed in the father's robe, accepted by the father, loved by the father and so accepted by all. And a banquet is given, a very public declaration by the Father that there's been reconciliation. And it is provided by the Father, for He is both the host and He is the one being honored. It is not the Son who's being honored, it is the Father who's being honored in what he has done. And thus the joy of the father here is paralleled with the joy of the shepherd in verse 6 and of the woman in verse 9. And so the final conclusion of all this is protection. The enemy stands outside. And who's the enemy? Who stood outside the banquet and wouldn't come in? The older son. The Pharisee. The Pharisee. This is why Jesus is telling this story. Because Jesus, Jesus receives and eats with sinners. The younger son. The Pharisee stands outside. As sheep has wandered astray, but is brought home. So, let me wrap it up for this morning. What, in all of that, what can we say? What, what can I give you to take home to encourage your heart? What's, what's the fifth lesson we can glean from all of this? Beloved, the ultimate goal of being rescued by God is that we might enjoy God. He prepares a table for us, even in the presence of our enemies. You see, unlike other religions where gods have to be served or carried or cleaned or, 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 or satisfied, our God is a God who serves. He ran to us. He kissed us. He embraced us. He brought us safe home. Our God is glorified by his constant ministry of grace to us. And he so delights in us. You can imagine the delight of the father in having this young son home again. And my friends, the delight of our father in heaven. He has, he has such pleasure in us that heaven hears the sound of his voice as he sings over us. And my, my brother and sister in Christ this morning, this is true of us. Despite all that we are, despite our failings of this past week, it doesn't matter. The Father is singing over us. He delights in us. He rejoices in us. He welcomes us. He accepts us. It's because of His great love for us and pleasure in us that our enemies stand unable to intervene or invade because who can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? In the secret of his tabernacle, we shall find a sure defense, a refreshing repose, an abundant provision, and a lavish display of sufficient grace. The beloved, our God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. So we are secured against the destructivenesses of our yesterdays, the menaces of our todays, and the unknowns of tomorrow. We are the Lord's guests, and our sanctuary is untouchable, impregnable, and unassailable. And that's why I urge you, never, never, never lose your joy in the Lord. Never lose the joy of your salvation. 
Never lose the joy that we, as we are right now, are perfectly accepted and perfectly pleasing to God. Guard, guard against that pharisaical spirit that is in each one of us. Because there's a Pharisee living in each of us. That would shift our focus from our perfect acceptance by God and put us on the line of us trying to be good and right and proper. We'll never be good and we'll never be right and we'll never be proper, but we will be accepted always in the beloved. Always be careful of examining yourself. You know, you come to the Lord's table and it says, let a man examine himself. And so we stop. What do you do with that text? What do you do with those words? Let a man examine himself. And you think, yeah, well, I wasn't, I wasn't too bad this week. Didn't have too many bad thoughts. I was kind to the next door neighbor. I didn't run that person off the road. I'm pretty good today. I can take the Lord's table. That's not what I was talking about at all. When a man examines himself, the conclusion that God is looking for is the conclusion that says, O oh, wretched man that I am. And in recognizing that, you recognize your great need again of the Savior. And so you take the bread and the cup. Because the text says, let a man examine himself. And so... Never stop at the first point of the text. Read it right through. Because all that you need is in Jesus. Beware of being too introspective of yourself and thus be careful of becoming an inspector of others. We're not policemen, we're pastors. And we're not here to inspect you, we're here to encourage you. We're here to lead and to love you. Enjoy the radical freedom, the infectious joy, and the surprising faithfulness of God. And never forget, never forget, Jesus eats with sinners. That means he eats with me. That means he receives me. That means he welcomes me. That means he provides for me a table and my enemies cannot touch me. May God bless his word to us this morning. Let us pray together.